You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 19th, 2024. Our topic is thymus genes and neonatal T-cell lymphopenia. This is presented by Dr. Javier Shannon. He is an allergist immunologist at Baylor College of Medicine in Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. Good morning, everybody. I'm Chris Miller. Welcome to Conferences Online and Allergy. Today is Monday, August 19th of 2024. Um, today, we're going to have two speakers, and our first one will be Dr. Javier Chinin, who is with Texas Children's Hospital. Um, Dr. Chinin has done a lot of work in the primary immune deficiency or inborn era of immunity, as we're now calling it, um, area, and has been a contributor to the practice parameters on that, too. Uh, they're under development again, um, so look forward to that. And today, Dr. Chinin is going to speak to, to us on thymic genes and neonatal T-cell lymphopenia. Thank you, Dr. Chinin. All right. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, today I, I wanted to uh, talk to you about uh, one topic of my per personal interest, and I, I think it's kind of uh, not uh, well covered uh, throughout uh, 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 the field, but uh, certainly I believe that it does uh, come to uh, our field from time to time, and mo uh, mostly if you are um, a, a practicing uh, with newborns. So uh, let me start with a clinical scenario that uh, I believe. Oh. Not working. Uh, let me see. Going to try again. Let me see again. It's not moving. This sometimes happens. Please, um, going to do this. I'm going to try it again. Yeah, all right. Okay, so the clinical scenario. Um, yeah, we do that, not see your slides oh, yet. No. We, we just have no. a picture of you. Oh. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. What is happening here? And let me just... just you know what I'm going to do? Um, different thing here. Did you see the... My screen? We, we do. We do. Now, I, I see it in presenting mode right now. Yep, there's excellent, working. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Fantastic. Nice. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Sorry for this. Um, so, um, the, the clinical scenario is that, um, as you know, the whole uh, in the whole United States, uh, we are now screening for um, severe combined immunity efficiency uh, through detecting uh, the, the tracks in the <clears throat> in the good card <clears throat> so um, it, so then when every st uh, state department has a different algorithm of what to do when there is a, a positive uh, for track uh, and, uh, and an alert for severe combined immunodeficiency. But um, clinical immunologists and allergen immunologists are part of this, this algorithm. And uh, in every state, uh, it's likely that you're going to be contacted. Uh, first, the pediatrician and then uh, the cl uh, clinical immunologists that are um, associated uh, with, with a, a pediatrician. 
or, or with the state. So there are, as I said, different ways of referral. So, so then what do you do? Um, then first examine the kid. Um, you don't, as, as in skid patients and other conditions, this, there's nothing really clinical. But then um, because of the positive uh, uh, result uh, the, of a, an, a, or abnormal result, uh, you order um, T cell phenotype. And then it comes not zero, which would uh, certainly alert you for skid, and not normal, 500. And then um, your other testing uh, immunoglobulins are normal. So, so what do you do, right? So that that is the one question that is not quite uh, a, a, a result for everybody. So, and and then because there are some uh, skid patients that might present with uh, with uh, a, a significant amounts of T cells. Then there is always the question whether this is actually skid and we need a bone marrow transplant. Then in, in the meantime, would you do antibiotic prophylaxis or not? So the, the important part of all of this is, is to understand that this uh, abnormal screening uh, doesn't just equal a skid and then we have a mid-level uh, T-cell counts in which we need to think of what we are going to do. And so then we have uh, this this uh, uh, great paper from 2019 from the experience on California that tells what uh, uh, diagnosis they had um, for the positive uh, 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 or, uh, or the abnormal tract in California. As you see, there is uh, there was some escape patients, but then a large percentage were syndromic. Uh, uh, congenital uh, genetic syndromes like the George uh, Down syndrome, ataxia injectasis, or other syndromes. Uh, a number of those, ba those babies uh, had a secondary uh, T cell lymphopenia during, uh, due to uh, heart problems, uh, intestinal problems. Uh, um, and then um, a large number of uh, those uh, abnormal uh, uh, newborn screening were because of prematurity. As we know, it, uh, those patients don't have enough a number of T cells uh, when they're born premature. Uh, but then uh, still there is a, a significant number of, of patients in which there is no abnormal uh, uh, conditions, secondary conditions, I would say, and they are not scared. And that is like in the, in the case that I presented. Uh, some of them were going to be later uh, uh, found to have a, a genetic uh, 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 lesion, but then there is still a, a significant numbers that are basically low T cell uh, counts that, that are not at the range of skid, uh, and that was one one in seven in that uh, series of over three million uh, screening patients. So uh, when it's not the skid, uh, and then what should we be thinking? So um, this is a cartoon to just remember um, that um, the T cells uh, go through a stage of differentiation in the thymus, and that is a, a one a condition that we traditionally uh, know as a George syndrome when that's defective. However, uh, the George syndrome is a clinical diagnosis mostly due to 22Q11 deletion. And when we don't find 22Q11 deletions, um, there are other gene defects to think about. And so there is uh, research done in the organogenesis of the thymus, and uh, mostly in the mouse, uh, however, giving us um, several uh, uh, molecular processes, and each of them uh, due to a complex interaction of multiple genes. And so um, it, this is being divided in, into the bio patches, uh, patterning and organogenesis, um, uh, thymocytes uh, development, and the development of function. And so here you might see 
some genes that uh, you might recognize, the TVX1, the deletion 22Q11-2 as uh, 112 as a, 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 a genetic lesion most commonly seen in the George syndrome. But also the CHD7 gene uh, that is associated with the charge uh, that diagnosis uh, diabetic embryopathy, uh, FOX and one and we're going to talk a little bit more about these genes. And then an undefined number of uh, a, a, a problems um, uh, that interfere with these processes and the final uh, development of the thymus. So, uh, which genes uh, have been uh, reported in humans that are associated with uh, thymus formation? TBX1, which is in the middle of the common deletion found um, in the George syndrome, the 22Q112. CHD7, charge, FOXN1, which has been associated uh, for many, many years to the new disk kit, uh, PAX1 and FOXI3. Those two genes have been previously um, associated with autofacial syndrome, meaning that there is an ear um, malformation and half of the face may not form the uh, 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 right way and you have a microcephalia. So these five genes are being included in, in most uh, targeted gene panels for immunodeficiencies. But there are other genes that have not uh, reported in humans, but have been found in mice that are part of this process, as we saw in the cartoon, EYA1, 6-1, PACS3. So um, I, I mentioned in this because uh, this, is, this is still possible that you do um, exome uh, sequencing and suddenly we find these genes and we want to pay attention to those as that they could be uh, a source of gene discovery in the future. Um, a, a reminder on, on genetics, um, when we say autosomal dominant, um, those conditions have variable penetrance, and variable penetrance means that they might not have the classical description initially ascribed to that. Uh, full disease manifestations have been initially reported with different severity in complete clinical picture. Some of them might be healthy and develop uh, uh, symptoms afterwards, and uh, this is explained because um, uh, environment infections or other inflammation, chronic diseases, or just plain age might determine uh, the, uh, the, the manifestations of these conditions. So when we say autosomal dominant uh, in, uh, uh, inheritance in a particular gene, uh, we are not expecting that everybody is going to have the same presentation. So this is the uh, most common known thymic defect uh, named as, as a DeGeorge syndrome or DeGeorge anomaly. Uh, we call it com complete with all the elements uh, of this uh, syndrome are, are in there. And for us, what is most significant is that there's no thymus and then no T cells. But there's also uh, oropharyngeal defects, the high palate or uh, uh, double uvula or uh, 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 present of a cleft pa palate. But with no thymus and no T cells, uh, this is very similar to severe combined immunodeficiency and uh, risk of pneumocystic pneumonia, failure to thrive. Other things that are particular on this syndrome is neonatal uh, hypocalcemic seizures, uh, lack of the parathyroid hormone. Usually a heart defect, but this is basically a conotruncal heart defect, not just any heart defect. Micrognathia and low set of ears are unique facies. It's important to mention that, that in the series of a completely George anomaly treated with a thymus uh, implantation or transplantation, only 40% have that 22Q11 deletion. 
And uh, in the UK, in the publication they did, one out of five have the 22 Q one English. Uh, what are the diagnoses responsible for most of the complete uh, uh, the George anomaly? Uh, fetal alcohol syndrome charge, as I mentioned, C uh, D7, bilocardiofascial, which is another clinical diagnosis without a genetic component, and diabetic embryopathy, which I believe uh, in your center uh, have described a number of cases in over there at Mercy. So, 38% have the 20Q11 deletion. So, this is in contrast to what we call the partial D George anomaly in which we have some T cells and over 90% can be explained by the 22Q112 deletion. T cells are present, but relatively low number. The, the cells that are there uh, are normal. It's just in, in a decreased number. They still have a number of infections that might be considered immunocompromised, however, not at the level of skin. And some of these uh, respiratory infections might be due to to the architecture of the of the uh, nasal cavity and the upper respiratory tract. In these patients, according to um, how many T cells are there, you might consider antibiotic prophylaxis. Most of them resolve them uh, over time. And so this is data from our center in which we followed a, a, a uh, uh, partial D. George uh, syndrome patients, and you can see this over time, up to uh, 10 years, how um, the cells, um, the T cells, CD4 T cells, remain kind of stable. Um, there was many, many years ago the concern that if you start low, you may end up actually being without any T cells because we, we knew at the time that there was a a physiological decrease on the number of T cells in, in the first two or three years of life. But uh, fortunately, uh, this this wasn't the case. And there is a, 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 a homeostatic mechanism that keeps the, uh, the T cells at the number that is not uh, becoming um, uh, as a severe uh, immunodeficiency. One thing that is important is uh, to mention is the diversity. So on these uh, uh, characteristics uh, uh, of the T cells that we study, uh, we want to know that we have a good number, but, but then also a good diversity. And I want to point out uh, this test, the T cell reverse diversity that uh, is being sent uh, in, uh, as an antibody uh, test. Um, uh, but what, if you send an antibody test for the T cell receptor diversity, um, you test for the presence of these families, but you might not test for clonality. Um, so I'm recommending that always look for a PCR uh, testing uh, for T cell receptor diversity. So with the antibody, you might see these clones recognized, but you might not see the diversity that you should have in each family. So last year, um, there was a um, report from the Clinical Immunological Society um, that recommended uh, some guidelines and immunological management. The data of what to do with these patients or these babies um, that come with low T cells, however, they are not at the level of a skid, but um, still low, um, has been argued for, for many, many years. So there, there, uh, there was the need for a consensus. And so here is the consensus. So it starts with whether these children um, uh, are able to be immunized with the uh, live vaccine uh, for measles uh, and rubella and for chickenpox. So uh, this consensus uh, agreed that at one year of age, if that CD40 cells is more than 400, CD8 cells is more than 200. There is a response to tetanus, and the proportion of naive T cells is more than the proportion of memory T cells. 
this will be reassuring that you should be able to uh, uh, immunize with live vaccines with confidence. And so uh, uh, <clears throat> this was this this consensus is of importance because there are many opinions uh, re regarding of when to immunize as a baby with T cell lymphopenia. Um, and that was based on the fact that there's been anecdotal cases in which people immunize without knowing that there was T cell lymphopenia and develop uh, pneumonia uh, to various to either chicken pox, to varicella or to measles. However, <clears throat> all those cases um, uh, basically are with uh, number uh, CD4 T cells less than this uh, for 400. The other thing that came out of the consensus is, is that we would like to um, use the George syndrome only when there is not a genetic diagnosis and start be a little bit more precise and use, use the uh, genetic diagnosis. So the 22Q11 deletion syndrome or uh, CHD7 for charge syndrome. Um, and then uh, define the degree of T cell lymphopenia. So there are many uh, of these 22Q11 deletion that don't have T cell lymphopenia at all. Those who do have it, uh, those who have congenital latinia and they need uh, immune restorative treatment in the form of thymic uh, transplant. And those uh, uh, that might, ha might not have uh, thymus um, and uh, also uh, um, um, have some T cells, but those T cells are actually uh, uh, clonal and um, they're uh, omen like syndrome, and they also need immune restoration with thymus transplant uh, or, or implantation. <clears throat> so, um, this, this is a review of. Um, the last uh, uh, criteria for SKID that um, uh, kind of clarifies uh, uh, what we call the SKID. Um, it's the typical SKID with less than 50 total T cells and with um, gene variant known, and then only the presence of maternal engraftment um, might define the SKID. <laughs> and then this is the category on, uh, in which we would have some issues in terms of uh, uh, thinking about diagnosis is when we have low T cell numbers but we don't know whether they are oliclonal or not and that's why the T cell diversity test is helpful. And then uh, um, uh, when uh, we have, um, well, TREX is what uh, defines this uh, condition uh, to, for, to study, but less than 20% of the CD4 T cells are naive. So when you have all uh, the, this criteria, then it's, it's helpful to uh, uh, consider that one is key. But when we don't have all the criteria, then we're still thinking this could just be T cell lymphopenia. And then we don't need to hurry up and go into a bone marrow transplant kind of uh, direction. And still, uh, you would like to think about antibiotic prophylaxis if the T cells are uh, at the uh, immunodeficient levels. Okay, so this is the clinical part. And I, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, what are the genes uh, most studied uh, that are uh, important in thymus organogenesis. So, FOXED1 was. Um, uh, studied as one of the key uh, genes uh, that are important on, on thymus organogenesis to the point that uh, uh, people who study the thymus, um, they divided in two major ones, uh, FOX1 independent and FOX1 dependent stages. Uh, this is more for the biologists. <clears throat> and uh, you might have heard about the new, the skid mice is this was described in 1966, at the time that uh, genetics were not uh, very well uh, known at, at all. And so, um, what I'm having this, okay. 
right? 1966. So after 30 years, um, a, the human equivalent of uh, the new mice were reported in, in Italy, which um, besides the lack of T cells, there were alopecia and nail dystrophy. And this was reported as an autosomal inheritance. Um, and then in 2019, um, it was shown that you don't need the two allele alleles to be compromised in order to have time uh, uh, problems. So uh, this group at, at the NIH uh, uh, put together a number of cases with T-cell lymphopenia in which the only genetic uh, problem was monoallelic uh, deletion or, or no uh, variants on the FOXN1 from. So um, this is uh, 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 one example in which uh, uh, the genetic disease uh, characteristics start changing over time as we know more about um, uh, populations and, and, and uh, genetic syndromes as they present. And um, one, one thing in this graph at the bottom is that this is very similar as the 22Q11 deletion in which you don't get um, uh, the T cells to go down to zero over time. Um, they kind of stay uh, low uh, following um, a kind, kind of a horizontal pattern. It's, according here, it's most concerning during the first two years of, of Slides because that's when they have the big difference between what is normal and what is not. Um, <clears throat> and um, they might be associated with recurrent infections. Um, uh, from that paper, um, this is to show how just having one problem or partial function of the FOXN1 reduces the size of the time without being totally null. Um, what are the mechanisms? Uh, this is about uh, FOXN1 interfering with the function of other genes that are important for time organogenesis. In our center, we have identified four of those patients. None of them are autosomal, I mean, none of them are biallelic. And what did we see in those patients? 70% um, uh, of lymphocytes size as opposed to 50%, so the number is reduced with 360. The most important is that there are no really uh, recurrent infections, but then we are being proactive and we have them in prophylactic pattern. All of them referred by the uh, newborn screening program for, uh, for SCA. This uh, other gene is interesting too, uh, FOX I3. Um, this is the gene that uh, has been implicated in ectodermal development and that in uh, Mexican and Peruvian hairless dogs and Chinese crested dogs are modified. And this has been attributed as an autosomal dominant trait. So our colleagues in, in Birmingham uh, reported, um, in, this was 2020, um, a collection of families in which uh, micro deletions in chromosome 2p112 uh, develop a T cell lymphopenia and uh, a, a small thymuses. So these uh, uh, patients uh, were at several, uh, I mean, at different uh, ages, uh, some of them 23, and what they uh, presented is with the variable. Uh, T cell lymphopenia, and that is what uh, I'm, I'm, I try to emphasize here is that when we have these lesions, not everybody in the family has to have the same uh, 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 manifestation. And so it's important to study these patients and uh, characterize them genetically. When they study um, mouse with the same mutants, they see that the thymus is um, a small and underweight. And then uh, uh, 
in in twenty twenty two, uh, uh, we and uh, um, colleagues in in DC reported uh, two cases in which um, monoallelic uh, deletion of foci three uh, uh, re resulted or were associated with T cell lymphopenia. So um, of interest is though is that um, this fox i3 causes uh, small ears and uh, micro a small a small head a small face uh, and that's been uh, uh, studied by people who are interested in formation of the ears but um, unfortunately uh, unfortunately fortunately the t cells are not studied on this patient so we don't, don't know whether they have lymphopenia but one thing is that it looks like they don't report uh, fr increased frequency of infections. So if they have lymphopenia, it's not uh, to the degree of uh, uh, having them at increased uh, risk, risk of infections. So uh, FOXN1, FOXI3, the next one is PAX1. Uh, in this one, uh, they have not been reported uh, in heterozygous, but uh, in uh, biallelic uh, uh, homozygous lesions, uh, they do develop uh, uh, T cell lymphopenia. And um, in this particular report, <clears throat> four of six received bone marrow transplant when there wasn't a, a, a good genetic uh, a, a studies. Uh, while uh, on, on follow up, uh, they are trying to get um, thymus transplants. And then uh, there's always the, the reports of uh, a, a no, no mutations uh, in this gene, however, without immunodeficiency. And then again, um, uh, emphasizing the concept of uh, penetrance. Um, okay, so this is a review of what we have reported. And then I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about um, uh, newborn screening because this is really what um, uh, prompts us to start thinking about T-cells and thymuses uh, in addition to, to SCID. There's been uh, several reports in Massachusetts and uh, New York and uh, California is the, the biggest. Some of them are just in one hospital like in Washington um, uh, uh, University in St. Louis. Um, one thing, uh, this is a, a table of uh, uh, the reported uh, papers. And so you're going to see different uh, number of uh, newborn screens, the largest thing in California. And then uh, the number of referred patients um, uh, kind of are in the same uh, uh, um, range, even though the numbers change a lot. And, and so why is that? Why, why um, this is changing the number of screen, number of refer, the number of skid uh, found remains more or less proportional to the number of screen uh, newborns. Uh, um, so uh, the key is in that um, each um, state uses a different cutoff in order to call a newborn screen for skid abnormal. The most stringent is in California, but then other states have it different. So I'm not so sure um, in your state um, what cutoff uh, they use, but um, the lower uh, the cutoff, the more specific you are, but then you're making uh, the T cell lymphopenias that might be a problem uh, to the patient, even though they are not scared. In, uh, at, at, in Texas, um, we have this report on that last 10 years not published uh, with very similar numbers to California, but then it's over four times more referred uh, babies, uh, but the number of skills remains constant, but then we probably have many more T cell lymphopenias that are identified and we need care for. Oh, here it is. Um, so California, less than 18 track is the positive. In Texas, we have 46. It's New York, Wisconsin, they have been changing over time. 
in order to be specific. Uh, and then in Illinois, less than 200, and Missouri, less than 37. <clears throat> so, so higher cutoff leads to more referrals, less specific for the skin, but more T cell lymphopenia is detected. And uh, there's always the question for each state to answer whether it's cost effective. For us, we take care of, of patients with uh, immune problems. Um, we do think that uh, we cannot just let uh, somebody with a T cell lymphopenia, even though they're not a skid, uh, to be without a good diagnosis and management. Um, so this is a review of what we were thinking, uh, I mean, of uh, the California, and we were saying earlier, um, one in seven is T cell lymphopenia without a specific diagnosis. Um, so three million to, to 100,000 screened. So this is the experience of Texas with another 3 million uh, a, a newborns a screening a year. Uh, this percentage is what the, of interest for state departments. How many are abnormal? Uh, how many are skid and, and what uh, is the cost effectiveness of the state program? The most frequent uh, secondary uh, cause of uh, a, a, a normal uh, newborn screen is low, low birth weight and prematurity. Uh, so uh, um, there is um, a different algorithm from the states are trying to implement to avoid uh, referrals until uh, a new uh, abnormal uh, screening is in there after premature uh, babies uh, reach uh, normal gestational age. Um, this this is just because every state has different regions and to see um, uh, whether maternal embryopathy might be a problem. So uh, one, one thing that uh, we found out from the Texas uh, database is that maternal diabetes is 6 to 8%. And so um, we don't really find that much uh, uh, T cell lymphopenia if we were uh, going to say that um, maternal diabetes is one cause of that. So this is an area of research. Uh, we need to really find out what in maternal diabetes produces T-cell lymphopenia. Uh, this is a uh, statistics from our center. In the last three years, we have, in our area, we have about 218,000 uh, births. And so from that, um, there was a referral of 100 patients that we have evaluated. Um, from them, most of them are secondary, either premature, congenital uh, conditions, uh, trisomy 21, uh, 22Q11, ataxetyl angiectasy. Have a few skid and atemias. This proportion of atemias equal to Severe combined immunodeficiency or almost equal is kind of something that's not being reported elsewhere. And uh, uh, in the last three years, uh, with this number of births, we have uh, six cases of T cell lymphopenia. Three of them, we think, corresponds to the FOX1 heterocyte uh, But then we have three that have not been diagnosed, and uh, we're trying to uh, keep uh, finding whether. Uh, uh, there is a genetic lesion on, on, on the other three. Uh, and, and why is this important? Is because mm, we need to be sure that all, all our patients that are born with uh, low T cells uh, have some sort of pro prognosis on whether they are going to uh, develop a, a skid or, or not uh, in the future. And when we don't know what's going to happen, we might assume that they are going to be just lymphopenia like any others. But we don't have that certainty. All right, and so in, in, in terms of my summary, um, non skid T cell lymphopenia is a clinical challenge uh, for uh, our specialty. A uh, significant proportion of, of the babies born with abnormal or undetectable outbreak might not have a genetic immunological diagnosis. As a group of those patients might present with atemia, due to gene defects affecting the thymus development, including the deletion of 22Q11. 
and some of the metabolic syndrome, particularly diabetic embryopathy. Um, clinical implications of, of this topic is that uh, for every uh, baby that comes with this lymphopenia, there's a question of whether we need to go into definitive uh, treatment, the thymus transplant versus uh, bone marrow transplant, or whether we only observe and see whether uh, 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 they either recover to normal T cell number range or remain uh, um, stable. Whether we indicate uh, uh, antibiotics for infection prophylaxis, the question of when are we going to recommend to the pediatrician that it's safe to give live vaccines, and uh, this future risk of autoimmunity is as we see these patients that that are born with low T cell and we follow them uh, longitudinally, um, there is a, a signal in, uh, that seems that about 10% are going to develop some sort of autoimmunity, which is a little, little bit uh, a, a larger number than normal population. Um, uh, uh, most half of these autoimmune problems are autoimmune cytopenias, uh, uh, hemolytic anemia, uh, uh, and, uh, and thrombocytopenias. And finally, uh, our work is, is the collaboration of immunologics uh, 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 that the hospitals, uh, healthcare providers, and the state health department. And um, hopefully, uh, um, with more studies and more examination of these patients, uh, we are going to clarify uh, all the questions that remain. All right. This my presentation and any questions.